Hi, this is Robert Wright. One thing I like about the conversations I have here on The Wright Show is that they help me think and write. They've informed the books and many of the articles I've written over the past 15 years. Now, lately, most of my writing has been for my newsletter, the Non-Zero Newsletter. It covers the kinds of topics you see on the show. Politics, foreign policy, psychology, philosophy, spirituality, how to avoid the apocalypse, things like that. So if you enjoy The Right Show, chances are pretty good that you'll enjoy the newsletter. It's free, and all you have to do to get it is go to nonzero.org and sign up. So I suggest that you hit pause, go sign up, and then hit play. Thanks. Hi, Sarah. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Not bad. Yourself? Well, that's about as good as one can expect these days, as you may have heard. Yes. Um, let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. You're Sarah Posner, familiar to some of our viewers and listeners because we've had conversations before. You're True. very well known for writing about uh, religion, and I would say in particular the religious right. And you've got a brand new book out on that very subject. Yep. And we're going to talk about that. It's called Unholy, Why White Evangelicals Worship at the Altar of Donald Trump. Congratulations. Thank you. What's it like publishing a book amid a pandemic that precludes some normal avenues of book promotion? It involves a lot of Zoom and Crowdcast Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, just trying to get the word out there when people aren't browsing in bookstores uh, or going to any kind of book festivals or events or anything like that. It's a little bit of a challenge, but, uh, you know, doing our best. Well, it's a really interesting book. I have been listening to it on the bike rides that, because of the pandemic, have become a part of my daily routine. Um, and uh, there's a lot to talk about. I wanted to start with a couple of uh, questions that uh, could only have occurred to me, actually, after the book was put to bed, about kind of um, recent news um, that... that is related uh, very much to the religious right. Um, one of them is about the guy who runs the Center for Disease Control, Redfield. Mm-hmm. Now, is it true that he is um, that this was uh, that Trump appointed him to please the religious right, or is that not true? Well, I have read that, but in real time, I was not aware of Redfield being any kind of. Um, pick to satisfy the Christian right. He's not somebody that I've seen them talk about or even praise pre or post pandemic. So, so at the um, time of the appointment, it didn't hit your radar screen. Not at all. Well, that says something because you definitely uh, stay tuned to this wavelength, right? Right. So people who were clearly intended to please the religious right and did please the religious right were Ben Carson, Betsy DeVos, um, Jeff Sessions for a while, Bill Barr. Um, there were other sort of lower level appointees like Roger Severino at the um, Department of Health and Human Services, who I talk about quite a bit in the book, uh, Mike Pompeo. Uh, so those were the kinds of names that were coming across my radar. Redfield definitely wasn't one of them. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I mean, apparently he, he is, I guess he is a serious Christian, and I guess his approach to to HIV emphasized abstinence or something. There was something about mm-hmm. his mm-hmm. history that, that appealed, but but uh, if you weren't aware of it, that suggests that, um, uh, possibly, that this is being a little overblown. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it's possible that there were... Uh, Christian right allies who promoted him to Trump, mm-hmm. um, but it was not the sort of thing that really hit hit my radar screen in any kind of way at any conference or talking to either um, activists or people close to Trump or mm-hmm. or um, or anything like okay. that. Yeah. So <laughs> then, I, then I will refrain from blaming the religious right for the way the pandemic has been handled henceforth. Um, one more, one more kind of current events question. Uh, I'm sure it got your attention, uh, as it got the attention of many others, uh, when Trump, uh, strolled 
through Lafayette Square to that church and held up a Bible amid the protests. Um, no doubt that was designed um, to appeal to a, a constituency you study. Mm-hmm. D- did did it seem like a success to you in political terms? Well, it wasn't. It didn't turn out to be that important to them, and it was obviously politically damaging to Trump. To for other constituencies, it was mm-hmm. ob- viewed as a a stunt, a photo op, and obviously there was the violence involved of the um, federal officers tear gassing and pepper spraying the protesters out of the park so Trump could walk through there with Barr. And then the aftermath when Trump and Barr lied about the whole thing um, and what transpired in order to clear the park of the protesters. Um, I think it was planned as, as something that would, was going to be this great photo op and it didn't really turn out that great. Um, but on the other hand, I don't really think it had a negative impact for his Christian right supporters because just because it wasn't great didn't mean that they necessarily focused on how bad it was. Mm-hmm. They're not the kind to complain about the cheesiness kind of a photo op. No, so right. Speak. The cheesiness was not a factor. And it, it it fell a little flat, I think, to a lot of people just because, including, I think, in the Christian right, because it wasn't necessarily like this was a church that has any resonance to a lot of evangelicals. It's an Episcopal church, a liberal Episcopal church. A lot of uh, conservative evangelicals would view it as not a true Christian church because Mm, mm. of its support for same-sex marriage and LGBTQ rights and so Mm. forth. Um, I think that Trump, in Trump's mind, because there had been a fire, uh, a a small fire in the basement of the church the night before, they really wanted to capitalize on this idea that the anarchists and the Antifa uh, rioters were going to set fire to churches all over the country. Mm. And he was... First, they don't say Merry Christmas, and next (laughs) thing you know, they're burning your church. Right. And so um, I think think that that was kind of the, the motivation to try to make it seem like he was protecting churches from Antifa arsonists, which I think just didn't... It just... I, I just don't think it really... Mm -hmm. did the trick. Now, I think I remember in the wake of this hearing that Pat Robertson said something not altogether approving of Trump. Now, had there been a falling out between them that I that I missed? Because, of course, he's like almost the grand old man of the religious right. He started the Christian Broadcasting uh, Company or Corporation, whatever it is. Network, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, So um, was this a was this a new thing? You know, he said it was, I watched actually the whole episode of of that program because as is, as is your daily ritual, I'm sure. <laughs> um, because I, I wanted to see the, sort of the context for for uh, for Robertson saying that because it got a lot of what, it got what, a did, lot he, of what did he say? Exactly? What was, what he was talked the, about clearing um, the protesters violently, clearing the protesters out of Lafayette Square. Um, in order for Trump to um, have the photo op. And he said, that was not cool. That's not cool. Hmm. <laughs> Which was kind of like hilarious to see uh, to see Pat Robertson saying that. And then if you watch the whole program, it segues from that to a news segment which is fear-mongering about the protesters being anarchists and Antifa, anti-American uh, hmm agitators who are going to turn the streets of America into a riot zone. So I think that if you were just casually watching the program, you might not have even really noticed or paid attention to what Robertson said, because then the next news segment was so filled with vivid imagery about so-called rioters that I think that that probably would have been what stuck with you. But what stuck to the mainstream press was that Pat Robertson told the president um, that what he did wasn't cool, but it didn't like, I just don't think that it had very much traction otherwise. It was kind of like the Christianity Today Mm -hmm. op-ed back in December where the Christianity Today editors called for Trump's impeachment and then the rest of his evangelical base was like, "Puppa, you know, that's just mm-hmm. Christianity today." Mm-hmm. Okay. So, as for the book, um, 
let's go ahead and do the plot spoiler and 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 ask you to answer the the question raised by the subtitle why do white evangelicals worship at the altar of donald trump i mean of course the 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 context of the question is that he would seem to be either not a very good christian or not a christian at all he's mm-hmm. the, the kind of guy who thinks that the the book of second corinthians is called two corinthians and on and on and on i mm-hmm. think i think when they asked him, what was it when he was running for president, they asked him if he ever asked God for forgiveness, and he kind of said, eh, nah, or something. What did he right. say? I forget what he said, but it was almost, you know, it was like, I could be a better politician than that, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. that's that. most people think that's not a hard question, and I guess maybe you could admire him for his candor, but then there's the, you know, the porn stars and so on. So right. that that's the the reason a lot of people outside of the evangelical fold do not understand the support for him right right well spoiler alert um (laughs) the christian right admires trump because they share with him an antipathy to liberal democracy and in particular to the entire project of the second half of the 20th century advancing civil rights and human rights for racial and other minorities, um, increasing or bolstering the the wall of separation between uh, church and state. Um, And, you know, even in the wake of Watergate, um, beefing up oversight, separation of powers, judicial independence, um, and a free press. Um, It turns out that they share a lot of animosity towards those things. That's kind of the spoiler alert. But along the way, there there was sort of a lot of excuse making as to why a movement that had long demanded of presidential candidates that they be not only be a Christian, but they have Mm -hmm. a salvation story to tell about themselves, how they came to Jesus, that they had a way of communicating to the base how they would govern from a biblical worldview or from a Christian perspective, um, how they would restore the Judeo-Christian foundation of America. You know, these, these were kind of the buzzwords that were always used. Um, and so how, why would they, why would they, what, what were the excuses that they made to come to Trump when they had the choice of, you know, Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or even Scott Walker, who like Cruz is a preacher's kid and talks mm-hmm. their language. Um, and so there were a number of excuses made along the way or rationalizations. Obviously, the one that people know about is he said that he would nominate the judges that they wanted and that he would. Um, nominate judges who would overturn Roe v. Wade or protect their religious freedom. And so from that perspective, it's seen as a purely transactional relationship where it was kind of a quid pro quo that, you know, he said, I'll do these judges for you. And they said, OK, we'll make sure everybody comes out to the polls for you. Um, but it's 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 more. um it's more like a supernatural than that too, for a lot of the base really. And I use the word supernatural intentionally that Trump is seen by many in the base, not all, but definitely people who come from a more Pentecostal or charismatic tradition. He's seen as uh, someone who was anointed by God, somebody who's like King Cyrus in the Bible. He may not be one of us, but he's protecting us and our way of life or our, vision our Jerusalem America mm-hmm. uh, and so there's a lot there's a lot going on there but at the heart of it is that he was willing through rhetoric and action to dismiss and undermine the entire like project of liberal democracy which many in the Christian right see as antithetical to their project of restoring Christian America. Okay, so there's um, there's a few things going on. For starters, they sense a commonality of values between uh, what Trump represents between uh, his political movement and themselves. And, and, and one thing, and we'll get to this, that you've alluded to already, is the values aren't just the ones we normally think of when we think about the bond right between right. the republican party and and the religious right it 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 goes 
beyond abortion and and LGBT. Um, and in fact, in your and your and you're telling the kind of origin story uh, of the of the religious right as a as a movement is is really emphasizes uh, different things than uh, than that. Um, but uh, so so there's a there, there's a commonality of values. Uh, and, but you're saying that when they're willing to overlook, um, the fact that this guy who's going to be kind of their leader is not a very good Christian, it isn't, it isn't merely transactional. Now, b- before we get back to the supernatural part, is, is this related to how much they feel under siege? In other words, it, it seems to me that the more threatened you feel, the less picky you're going to be about who the leader is so long as you think that leader is going to be effective, right? So is, and, and, and Trump has the aura of a strong man, as, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. he has, as a guy who's going to go, the field general who's going to go get the job done. Right. Uh, and I'm sure a lot, a lot of them would say they'd rather have a guy who really went to church and really did all this stuff and didn't do some of the things Trump does. No, I um, actually think they'd rather have Trump. <laughs> well, but wouldn't they rather have somebody who was both? In other words, a, a, a true believer, but... They'd but ra- okay, so if Trump doesn't get reelected, who would be their next standard bearer? Somebody mm-hmm. like Josh Hawley, who has all of the sort of authoritarian instincts, mm-hmm. but also the church-going, right. Bible-citing, religious freedom, quote-unquote, defending instincts too i guess that's what i mean is the more they feel threatened uh uh the more they're going to emphasize the authoritarian part the strong the strong man part and be willing to sacrifice things for that does that make sense yeah um and i think that for them it's not a sacrifice right like so they're not in terms of oh they're willing to sacrifice something in to them, that is the point, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to being a sacrifice. Because in their mind, things have gone too far, right? So it's gone too far that um, that um, LGBTQ people can now um, be protected from employment discrimination. That's just another example of how the whole civil rights project has gone too far mm-hmm. or that the Supreme Court has um, maintained, although in recent years has chipped away at a, a, the wall between church and state. Another piece of evidence that they like Trump's authoritarian instincts or moves um, is their willingness to go along with his attacks on um, on the judiciary, um, or to st- st- um, st- um, stack the judiciary with like minded judges, but also his attacks on a free press. I mean, the, the Christian right is one of his top promoters of the idea that um, the news is fake news and that it's out to get him, uh, mm-hmm. or that the government, you know, is. The Christian right for a long time blasted, you know, government, you know, anonymous government bureaucrats in Washington who are trying to take away your rights. But now they've gone all in with Trump's conspiracy theories about a deep state that not only are they trying to take your rights as a Christian away, but there's some like vast, deeper conspiracy Mm -hmm. to undermine you, to undermine the American way, to undermine Trump. Yeah, you know, it's this is just a tangent, but that the, the conspiracy theory part goes way back. I remember when Pat Robertson would talk up the New World Order, mm-hmm. the black, you know, kind of the black helicopters are going to come take our sovereignty away. Now, Trump uh, uh, periodically revisits that theme. He's very anti-global governance, but I never totally understood why that would be part of the of the religious rights Mess. I mean, I saw it as I guess I see why it would be part of the rights message, ki- kind of why there would why there would be an emphasis on national sovereignty. But but uh, the extent to which kind of Robertson did that up always seems strange to me. But does that... Well, for the Christian right, the 
the idea of the New World Order comes from their end times theology, where that's mm-hmm. part of when the Antichrist returns, he's going to, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to force everyone to be part of this New World Order where individual nations won't have sovereignty, but there's some nefarious global leader who's going to force you into some supposedly liberal ideology. Um, and so, that was already a sort of a resonant thread in a lot of evangelical communities and uh, charismatic and Pentecostal communities. But then with Trump, you also have the added layer of the, um, the resurgence or the reemergence of, of what was what we call the alt right, but these far right white nationalists Mm -hmm. and people like Steve Bannon who also attack the globalist ideology or globalist or just the idea of globalism. You know, and when when Bannon talks about that, he's not just talking about um, a global economy. <laughs> he's talking about the whole idea of um, liberal democracies helping or spreading or seeding liberal democracy or civil society in in other countries, like particularly after World War II, right? Mm -hmm. Or after the fall of communism. I mean, he's referred to that as a humanitarian expeditionary force um, in this sort of pejorative way of of looking at um, the U.S. having a role in the world of helping societies or helping fledgling democracies um, build up civil society Mm -hmm. and democratic institutions. Um, Someone like Steve Bannon portrays that as this nefarious globalism, which is forcing these kind of liberal democratic ideas and about human rights in particular um, down everybody else's throat. Uh, And so these two kind of strains of anti-globalism really come together in Trump. I don't know that he's necessarily that familiar with end times theology, although maybe some of his evangelical friends have filled him in, but I don't really, I don't really necessarily see it coming from that. When he talks about that, I kind of feel that it's coming, my sense is it's coming more from like a Bannon kind of ideology. Kind of just ethno-nationalism. Yeah. Um, So, uh, on this, so let's get back to Cyrus and this idea of the supernatural, because I think, so as you said, uh, there's this idea uh, among evangelicals, that Trump can be compared to uh, Cyrus, who was a, a Persian king who kind of delivered the Jews, uh, this is in the Old Testament, uh, from their Babylonian uh, captors, right? They had, they had uh, this had been their, their disaster. The Babylonians mm-hmm. came uh, to Israel, took them off, um, and, and uh, Cyrus defeated the Babylonians, returned them to Israel, um, and, and comparing Trump to Cyrus, I'm struck by a couple of things. One is it's interesting that they, they chose somebody who's not, who wasn't even a Jew, somebody who was outside the faith. You know, you might think if, the, if they just needed to explain why Trump wasn't a great Christian, they could have com- said, well, King David fooled around with Bathsheba, but he was still a good king, right? Like something they like that. They used that one too. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm sure it's, 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 it's obviously there for the taking, but, but the, but still the emphasis on Cyrus, it, it's interesting to me in that regard. But then the, the second dimension of it is, I guess, what you mean by the supernatural, right? Because Cyrus in, in the Bible is depicted as someone who was actually, it was an instrument of God. This was not just happenstance. This right. was his, uh, his ordained mission. And, and that's kind of what you mean by the, the supernatural thing. Yes. That sometimes God chooses an unlikely leader to save a nation at a particularly precarious time. And so Trump obviously right you know like it doesn't seem obvious to you or me right but when they talk about trump when trump's evangelical supporters talk about him they talk about all of the things that he has been brave and strong enough to do um unlike 
other leaders who've been more tepid or afraid of political correctness or afraid of which way the political winds were blowing. Um, Trump is afraid of none of those things, right? So from our perspective, we look at that and it's like, oh, he's just forging ahead with these authoritarian moves. He's he's ignoring the law and the procedures that you're supposed to use to, uh, you know, reverse a regulation or he's, you know, pushing through with McConnell's help, pushing through these judges or attacking the press or whatever it is that he's doing that is portrayed as being very brave as opposed to being very authoritarian (laughs) and um and so these are all virtues which is why i say you know it's the authoritarianism that they like they don't like him in spite of the authoritarianism they like Mm -hmm. him because of it okay and i guess kind of relatedly uh I mean, you're suggesting that there's a more thoroughgoing connection between the values of the religious right and the values of Trump than we might think. I mean, and and I think one way to get at that is to go back to the origin story of the of the religious right. So 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 what I'm saying, I mean, viewed from afar, one might think, as you suggested, well, okay, they've got a couple of issues that are important to them. Uh, gay rights, uh, abortion. Um, as it as it happens, the alt right is 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 part of the vehicle for delivering uh, progress as they see it uh, on these values, and so they'll take that. You want to argue that actually there there's a deeper connection with the values of the alt right, right? Well, the antagonism towards civil rights and liberal liberal democracy Mm -hmm. is definitely a value that they both share even though you know so so political coalitions can come together in the smoke field room right but then they can also just come together otherwise so i don't argue that they came together in a smoke field room right it wasn't like richard spencer and tony perkins got together and decided to support trump it did not work that way at all in fact I know and believe that those two men would have a great deal of, you know, antipathy towards each other. Um, But what you saw as Trump launched his campaign was the more he used racist and nativist rhetoric and proposed racist and nativist policies, the alt-right was becoming electrified by the idea that they could have a presidential candidate who spoke to what they believe they call white dispossession, right? The idea that Mm -hmm. white people's um, cultural and political dominance is being taken away by non-white people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And uh, the Christian right, a lot of the leadership of the Christian right was very hesitant with Trump. There There were some leaders who were with him pretty much right out of the box. But a lot of the heavy hitters were in the Marco Rubio or particularly Ted Cruz camp. But what they saw was the base was going for Trump, right? Mm -hmm. And so they kind of ended up having to follow along. And so Trump spoke to a base, a white base, um, that sort of shared his ideas about or shared his ideology um, about what was wrong with America, um, that we needed to go back to the way America used to be before it was taken over by political correctness and liberals and mm-hmm. all of those terrible things um, and immigrants and so on. Um, and so they ended up coming together. Now, there were people who obviously thought that this coalition was a good idea. Like, you know, when I interviewed Steve Bannon at the Republican convention, he told me that the alt-right needed the Christian right, because as a movement, the alt-right wasn't big enough to win an election, or I think, as he put it, to, you know, um, overtake, or uh, I can't remember the word he used, but to do battle with um, the progressive left. And so... It starts to make more sense in a way if you see this as a coalition of lost cultural dominance and a sense that liberal democracy was taking a belief that liberal democracy was taking away their rights, their rights as white people or as Christians. 
Mm-hmm. And then when you look back at the, you had asked me about the origin story. That was kind of a long answer. Um, well, so, can I just actually pick up on that one thing when you, you, sure. you said they're ident- as white people or as Christians? Seems to me it's like a little hard in trying to discern the exact motivation. It's a little hard to control your variables because when they look back for a lost to a lost America. Like, mm-hmm. say, of the 50s, before all the turmoil, and before right. any of them were... Before Brown v. Board of Education. And before most of them were born, right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's true that it's true that it's a wider America, so you could say this is fundamentally uh, an, a, a racial motivation. On the other hand, it was also America in which more, more people said Merry Christmas, and there was prayer in the schools. It was a more religious America. It was a less secular America. Uh, it was America. It was an America with no gay rights. It was an. It, it was. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, the abortion thing is a little dicier uh, as mm-hmm. we'll get to. But, but you know, it, it's uh, because I, because another thing you point out is uh, they uh, you know the, there's an identity they identify more than you might imagine uh, with you know kind of Putin's uh, the ethno nationalism in Putin's Russia and there too. It's partly a, it, it, there's a, there's Christianity evolved, but it's also a, a nostalgia for a, a lost world in a lot of ways, along other dimensions. So it's, mm-hmm. um, and I think here maybe the the origin story becomes important uh, in trying to sort through the motivations. But you take my point right that nostalgia is a kind of a fuzzy thing, and and uh, and in this case in particular. There were a lot of different things that are part of the that were part of the America that they're nostalgic for some some religious some ethnic and so on right right and nostalgia is also about myth making about what America was like you know before right mm-hmm. so um, and yes I think that you know in both camps or to the extent there's crossover in these in these two camps um, that sort of myth of the what what the lost america was before before what it was for white people right i mean um that yeah i mean i think that that is clearly part of it but it's also this sense or this belief or this idea that's propagated that um things were better before civil rights and before the government started to enforce those civil rights on you. Because if you're a white Christian and then all of a sudden you have to abide by the government's rule on how to run your private school, um, that's that's sort of like a, a, a clear, tangible way in which, to you, your rights are being taken away. So this gets us to the origin story, right? Mm-hmm. So... I think the Christian right today would want you to think that on January 23rd, 1973, the day after Roe v. Wade was decided by the Supreme Court, they leapt into action to defend the unborn. Um, And that's the origin story of the Christian right. But it really um, is not (laughs) Um, that there were... Catholic activists who were very much opposed to abortion, even before Roe, um, but that they had a hard time convincing a lot of their evangelical um, potential allies um, that this was something that um, they needed to get involved in politics over. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing that really did get white evangelicals involved in national politics was the desegregation of private schools. So after Brown v. Board and and court-ordered school desegregation of public schools, um, the IRS decided that it was federal policy that if we're going to have desegregated public schools, you can't use a private school to do the things that were and use your tax exempt status to do Mm -hmm. the things that we don't let the public schools do. And so it took away or threatened to take away the tax exempt status of private schools, including private Christian schools, um, if they did not basically desegregate. Now, some of them weren't explicitly, some of them were segregation academies. They were formed for the explicit purpose of being segregated. Others were not explicit segregation academies, but they were essentially all white. Mm -hmm. And so the IRS came in with these, you know, rules that were very kind of mild about like, you know, well, it has to, you have to have this percentage of the percentage of 
uh, minority students in your community in your school. And if you don't, then you need to take these steps like recruiting more um, minority students or bringing in more minority teachers or playing sports with another school that has minority students. I mean, it was really kind of mild. Mm -hmm. Um, But they took this up. um, Particularly, there was a... um, a, a, a Christian school uh, expert and promoter named Bob Billings, who was actually the first executive director of the um, of the Moral Majority, who took this up as like his own personal um, political crusade. And this is you, in this you see the roots of the Christian rights antagonism towards the government um, and the idea that the government, when it enforces civil rights for other people, is actually taking away Christians' rights to religious freedom. Mm-hmm. Okay, so court-ordered desegregation, first in the public schools and then in the private schools, in effect, or, or well, the, the private school whether that was court order or not, government-mandated desegregation of, of, of public and private schools, you're saying was the original motivating issue that started turning the, the religious right into an, into an organized political thing. And right. this this was at the hands of, uh, partly at the hands of Paul Weyrick, is that yeah. right, who was a, a Catholic yeah. conservative activist, um, and, um, and, and he more than anyone else, else uh then added abortion to the agenda in 1973 is that well no that's actually not, not well what is your thesis on 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 how exactly abortion got added to the agenda it didn't get well for why why Rick was a conservative catholic and he was always against abortion even before mm-hmm. Roe, right and then after Roe. He was looking for a way to build a coalition of what was then called the New Right. And the New Right was kind of, you know, like Goldwater conservatives, um, a group of um, activists and people like Weirich. Weirich was sort of one of the key players um, who believed that the, that the Republican Party and the conservative movement needed an infrastructure in Washington um, and an infrastructure that was different from, say, like the National Review kind of country club conservatism Mm -hmm. that was more focused on blue collar workers in the heartland who were being, you know, left behind by conventional Republican politics. Sound familiar? Um, (laughs) And, you know, so I argue in the book that this is a forerunner of the Trump coalition, right? Because um, he's looking to bring together, you know, ethnic whites and and religious conservatives, mostly religious Christian conservatives, um, and so he's looking for a way to pull all these people together. And he has Catholics who are anti-abortion, and he need he sees the need to bring in white evangelicals and fundamentalists into this coalition to really build a robust right-wing coalition to undergird mm-hmm. the Republican Party. And he just like can't convince the evangelicals to come on board. And then this school, and he's dealing with the leaders at that point, right? He he's. Uh you mean he can't convince he's individual? He's trying to recruit a leader, right? So right. he doesn't. You know, there isn't. There, there are people who are well known, right? In in evangelicalism, right, or in the fundamentalist world from which you know Billings and and Falwell come, right? But to get them organized at a national political level, this was a great frustration of his. He couldn't get, like, he couldn't find the issue that was like, ooh, that's the spark that's going to get these people excited and into it, right? And abortion wasn't really it. Uh, And, but Billings was such, um, he was so engaged in this Christian school issue. Mm-hmm. And um, Wyrick really liked him. I mean, I got the sense, I, I, I went, um, I looked at, uh, I researched Weirich's papers, which are at the University of Wyoming, um, for the book. And I really got the sense from looking at all of the correspondence from this time um, that Weirich really liked Billings a lot better than he liked Falwell. I mean, mm-hmm. that was really my sense. It seemed like he thought Billings was sort of a better organizer and more uh, reliable. And um, he did end up, you know, kind of being the 
the linchpin of bringing the moral majority together. And then afterwards, they t- they they brought on abortion. Be- I think in part because they realized that to have this Catholic and evangelical coalition, they needed to have some shared issues too, and and mm-hmm. so abortion kind of became that issue. But the school. Um, the school tax exempt status issue and the school desegregation issue just lingers and lingers and lingers. It's still so resonant in the religious right. Hmm. The idea that the government could take away your tax exempt status um, or take away some other benefit or privilege because in, in violation of your religious freedom or because of your religious beliefs. It's so resonant that just last week when the Supreme Court ruled in the Title VII case that um, – employers can't fire you under uh, federal employment law based on your um, sexual orientation or gender identity. One of the first things that Christian right leaders started talking about after the decision came down was, oh, are they now going to take away our tax exempt status Mm -hmm. as churches if we don't hire uh, LGBTQ people? So it's still, it just hangs over everything and this idea that the government is in, the government in enforcing or vindicating the civil rights of other people is necessarily taking away Christians' religious freedom. Okay. So the moral majority is formed, I think, formally at the end of the 70s, 79 79. or something. Mm -hmm. So Roe was in 73. So by 79, abortion had kind of caught on at the grassroots, right? By the time the moral majority comes into existence, abortion is is an issue of genuine concern among grassroots evangelicals is that starting to, to be yeah starting because you know be, yeah. i have a theory about why it was kind of ripe for the picking so to speak why it was uh uh a natural issue to rally around you know when i was uh when roe came out i was a sophomore in high school in texas and i had a couple of teachers who expressed opposition to it a biology teacher and a history teacher and the the uh now i don't know i i would think almost certainly the history teacher was a was an evangelical the biology teacher could have been a catholic but anyway what the history teacher said was the people who favor abortion are the people who want to have their fun and not pay for it so 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 for for him he was associating abortion with a kind of irresponsible promiscuity mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. with premarital sex and with a bunch of things that, in fact, a lot of evangelicals were opposed to, right? Right. I mean, so, I, think, I think that there's a difference between I am individually, I think, you know, this is just encouraging a promiscuous culture, um, a, a promiscuous secular culture. And I want to get involved in a movement that's going to change this on the national level or get involved in sure. a movement that's going, to, um, that's going to really motivate people to run for office based on their opposition to this issue or some other issues that, um, that mean a lot to me. And that was what Wyrick was talking about. Mm-hmm. He, couldn't, he couldn't get – he talked about it with a lot of, in a lot of different fora afterwards – as sort of like postmortems on how the moral majority came together, and he he said in a number of to- a number of times that he just could not get them excited about it. But the idea that the IRS was going to come after their tax exempt status mm-hmm. was <laughs> was a great motivator. Yeah. No. All I'm saying is I do think there was some. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, in some sense, uh, the abortion issue was kind of put on the agenda from. Above, so to speak, by the, the, the Wyricks of the world, maybe. But it seems to me it, it did have a natural resonance. I mean, the reason it needs explaining is because, as you note, before Roe, the Southern Baptist Convention was on record as not being opposed to, to legal abortion, right? Right, it, right. It, it was not a matter of doctrine among evangelicals no, before that's Roe. Right. As, as, I, as opposed to the Catholic Church, I'm, right? I'm just saying I think the, 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 you know, conditions were kind of, in a certain sense, ripe. It was a... In a way, it's it's not hard to associate it with opposition to an increasingly secular kind of morality that you see as a threat. I, I guess. think that's true. And then also, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I don't really get into this in the book that much, but um, Francis Schaeffer played a big role in bringing evangelicals in with his movie. Um, 
um, now how shall we live? It was an it was an anti abortion movie that he took around and showed to you know evangelicals, and he talked about this um, coalition of co belligerents, Catholics and evangelicals who could come together on this issue because you know it wasn't necessarily a natural theological alliance between the ca- Catholics and evangelicals at that time. Um, Even though now we kind of take for granted that the Christian right is a coalition of evangelicals and Catholics and conservative, other conservative Protestants. But um, so I wouldn't want to undercount uh, Schaefer's role in all of this. He Mm -hmm. definitely played a big role, too, in bringing the abortion issue to the fore. So anyway, I I, I guess one thing you're saying, you know, if 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 we if Trump's ethno nationalism is taken to be ethno in the sense both of race and of religion, right? Like Mm -hmm. uh, Christian as an Christianity as an ethnicity, white as an ethnicity. You're suggesting that uh, there was more affinity for the white part of that. I'm not saying this very well, but from the beginning, built into the very organization of the Christian right as an organized, as an organized thing, as a mobilized thing, there was an emphasis on race at the beginning that you're saying even predates the emphasis on things like abortion. Yes. Yes. And some of the other, um, some of the other activism that early new right organizers. So when I refer to the new right, I'm talking about Wyrick and Howard Phillips and and William Rusher, who was the publisher of the National Review, and other um, other people who were sort of in that who were in that orbit of the New Right activists, mm-hmm. they were very animated by race. Uh, so, for example, one of the um, local thing- issues that they would send. Um, folks from Washington to kind of go get involved in was this controversy um, in Kanawha County, West Virginia, over changes to the public school curriculum to be more inclusive and more acknowledging of the role of black people in American history and culture. And, um, you know, so you can see, you know, a lot of these things the resonance today is still is still with us right Mm -hmm. um so and that was almost purely about race but they made it about religion right so like the the claim that this new these new curriculum materials were offensive to um white christians Mm -hmm. um and so these were that and busing and the the Christian school IRS issue, these were issues that um, really animated the new right in the 1970s and became like part and parcel of the new right and religious right coming together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the William Rusher thing is interesting. So he was the publisher of National Review when William F. Buckley was the editor. And I guess, does that mean uh, Rusher was the owner too? Was he the source of the money? You know, I don't know that. Um, I think he was brought on because of his, you know, business mm. and legal acumen. Okay. He's a lawyer, too. Because Buckley, is, isn't he uh, famous for trying to disassociate uh, the right from an emphasis on race? He certainly wants to weed out the anti-Semitic connotations, right? I, I mean, he wants to, I mean, Buckley wants to kind of prettify, uh, well, maybe that's too cynical a word, but you know what I mean, yeah. right? I yes, mean, the, yes. The, 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 it seems to me like these two guys had different agendas, Buckley and Rusher. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, I don't know that they had different agendas necessarily, but Rusher was very involved in um, the new right and coming up with this, um, you know, th- promoting and talking about the idea of maybe having a third party candidate like George Wallace, who would appeal to this base that they were very concerned about feeling left behind Mm -hmm. um, in the current, you know, social and political environment. And so Rusher promoted the career of this guy named um, Bob Whitaker, um, who was a contributor to a number of, of new right um, publications and, and uh, essay collections and wrote a book of his own. Um, and this guy worked in the Reagan administration, got the job with Rusher's help um, and, uh, and then went on to become the hero of the alt-right 
um, for writing what's known as the mantra, the white genocide mantra, which basically says that, you know, anti-racism is genocide for white people. Mm -hmm. Um, So Russia, I think more than people really realize or appreciate was while he on the one hand was working for Buckley in the National Review. On the other hand, he was sort of denouncing this kind of country club republicanism and trying Mm -hmm. to find this third way uh, with a candidate, if not George Wallace, somebody like that who could express those kinds of concerns um, for the, you know, the left behind white Mm -hmm. people. Um, Now, Buckley himself, yes, like I I think that like he is part of this phenomenon on the right of playing whack-a-mole with these extremist figures, right? So one of the one of the people I, I profile in the book is Peter Brimelo, who's now well known mm-hmm. for his role in the alt right and his anti immigrant website called V Dare. Mm-hmm. Um, and he at one time was kind of the toast of the town. You know, he wrote a book, an a anti immigration book. He was published, you know, he wrote for National Review. He had a cover story based on his book in National Review. And then um, Buckley came under pressure because, he, uh, you know, Brimelow is a racist. And so he fired him. Um, but, you know, over the years, National Review has had other writers like that that have been let go or exposed as having been. Right. Who was the one who was fired far? about Dubrishire. a year ago? Yeah, it yeah, was yeah, a little yeah, yeah. longer yeah, yeah. than that. Yeah. So John Dubrishire, who now work, writes for Brimelow's V-Dare. So Brimelow hmm. calls this hmm. whole establishment conservatism, Inc., that, you know, that they you know, secretly, you know, agree with their views, but they have to be sort of respectable about it. And so they have to cut loose these people who are too honest about, about their views on race in Mm -hmm. particular. Yeah. So, so on the immigration issue, um, you know, it's, uh, and and again, this is a case where maybe you can uh, try to separate the effects of, of race and religion. You, on the one hand, um, the, uh, the, I guess the religious right, that, that demographic includes no few, uh, working class whites who might feel threatened by immigrants, period. So as an, as an economic matter, there might be a sense of threat that they can, they can take the jobs that we need. Um, on the other hand, a lot of the immigrants are Christians, right? The immigrants who could take their jobs are Christian. Now they're not, they're not Protestants. But on the other hand, it seems like the religious right uh, isn't too picky about that particular issue in the way uh, they might have been 50 years ago, right, when Catholics were considered almost alien to many Protestants. So, um, but anyway, I guess the the the, the religious character of uh, immigrants from the, from the South has. Uh, has not been enough to endear them um, to the religious right, uh, at, at least so far as that is manifest in in the attitude toward immigration policy. Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, for uh, among white evangelicals, there is uh, Trump is Trump is correct on on immigration. Um, now there are a number and a growing movement within white evangelicalism that is a opposed to that kind of not only anti-immigrant immigrant rhetoric, but anti-immigrant policy. Um, but it's been largely sidelined aside from doing on the ground work, you know, like refugee resettlement, not that there are any refugees coming anymore, but um, you know, there are evangelical groups like um, world vision, mm-hmm. um, world relief um, who uh, help resettle, uh, it, refugees in the United States and are very, you know, we're very opposed to immigration restrictions and refugee restrictions. But, you know, to the extent that there is that movement within evangelicalism, it's been hard for them to kind of break through in the Trump era, I think, because people like Russell Moore, um, who opposed Trump very openly and vociferously during the campaign have been so he, he was a uh, like, head of the southern baptist kind of political operation and he, he still was, is yeah uh, and and was and as trump entered office was i guess trying to give uh 
Southern Baptist a more progressive character almost, right? Yes. I mean, than they had been associated with in the past. Yes. Um, but he's been, you know, largely silenced on that. Now, mm-hmm. he... Not more prog- more progressive on like immigration and race issues, not mm-hmm. more progressive on issues relating to abortion and LGBT issues. Um, he's definitely very conservative on all of that, mm-hmm. that those kinds of issues. So in that sense, the Trump presidency has been for an evangelical like that, the Trump presidency has been good on those issues. And they've been someone like him has been largely silenced, silenced mm-hmm. on the other, other issues on the race and immigration issues. Okay. So how do you, where would you say we are now and, 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 and how do you see the future? I mean, before, before we started taping, you and I were alluding to the sense that things aren't exactly under control right now in this country. I mean, there really is, you know, kind of a sense of, uh, of, of chaos or whatever. And, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it seems to me it's, uh, it's almost gotten beyond religion in the sense that there's so many different icons that can be invoked to define the tribal boundaries. I mean, in other words, from the point of view of the religious right and, and the right generally, there's these young people trying to tear down a statue of Andrew Jackson. You know, he wasn't he wasn't a Confederate mm-hmm. general. He, he's he's he was an actual president. Um, and 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 there are these people who have seized control of. Seattle and, and so on. And, uh, and they're being told that, that, you know, there's a, they are most inherent, almost inherently part of a white supremacist structure that pervades, you know, this is the way they, they, no, I'm just saying, you know, I see a lot of not issues other than the traditional, uh, than the several that we've talked about, you know, LGBTQ and abortion and so on. I mean, the the uh, the tribal lines now seem so cleanly and solidly drawn. Um, well, I think that for the, for the religious right, Trump, like they almost. <sighs> They will, they will lose some people, I think, just because of the chaos of the Trump era, right? Um, but I think for a lot of people who are very invested in the religious right ideology or, you know, basically marinated in the religious right ideology, it would be very hard for them to vote for Joe Biden. They might stay home or maybe they would write somebody in. And I think, like, with 2016, you're going to see some peeling away of people, um, who now, is that because are, of who Biden is or because of the the coalition they associate him with? The latter. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, so I think you will see some peeling away. Will it be enough? Um, you know, so basically, so Trump won 81 percent of white evangelicals in 2016. Will he he needs to do at least that to win in 2020 because he's losing support in other demographics that supported him in 2016, right? So appealing away of a small amount of white evangelicals could be fatal to him, right? But even if that happens and he loses, uh, you know, there are questions of will he take the results as being legitimate and so on. Um, but then there's the question of how is this base going to react to having lost and who control, who will control the Senate? Will the Republicans still control the Senate? Um, what is going to be the effect of the Trump judges on the judiciary and who is the next standard bearer that this base is going to look for? Um, will it be somebody less chaotic, more capable, perhaps like a lot of the things that they like about Trump you know, oh, he's a disruptor. Uh, he, uh, you know, he may not be a Christian, but he, um, you know, he speaks for us. Um, might not fit with somebody like Josh Hawley or Tom Cotton or any of the other people that we would think of being um, successors uh, to Trump or running in 2024. Um, but you know, so they're not going away, right? So, like, if mm-hmm. you convinced this base for the last five years that Trump is anointed by God that um, God has his hand on him, that there's a deep state and a fake news who's out to get him and undermine him and take away your rights. What is their reaction going to be to losing, right? It's very worrisome. Um, and I think that in terms of the situation now, I think the coronavirus thing 
is kind of an unknown factor. I mean, I think we don't know. I mean, how how many people are going to be dead by election day and what's going to be the re- reaction of the electorate? Who knows? I think on the Black Lives Matters protests, I think that the Christian right, this kind of standard view is, you know, what happened to George Floyd was terrible and a tragedy and shouldn't have happened. Um, but all this other stuff, defund the police, take the statues down, that sort of thing. I mean, that is not like they're not going to be behind that. So I think, I think we have a lot of unknowns in the months ahead of us. Um, Trump looks like he's flailing now, but we still have a lot of months and weeks to go before election day. And just longer term, do you see hope for the intensity of the battle uh, abating? I mean, you know, these, uh, these issues that, Again, not all of them were always uh, at the forefront of the minds of uh, conservative evangelicals, but they are now, such as abortion. Um, And uh, they seem non-negotiable. You kind of tend to go one way or the other on them, and they seem to be losing. They see themselves as losing the cultural wars, and they are, right? I mean, they're not wrong. Well, uh, they, they might. I mean, as we speak, we're waiting for a Supreme Court decision on in an abortion case. They could well win that one. Right. Yeah, I suppose. Um, now, that's an interesting question because they've, they've lost within the last couple of weeks. They've lost a court ruling that uh, kind of so the, now the LGBT. First of all, just a side question. And I'm, this is really naive. And I know I sound like an old an old guy when I asked this, but LGBTQ is the Q part technically necessary. It seems to me that the preceding letters encompass everything the Q would encompass. Does that make well, sense? Yes, but there are other um, c- categories or identities encompassed are, in that. that that are not encompassed in the L or G. Well, some people, B. yeah, some people would not identify with, any of those four, but would but, identify. But they would call the themselves queer. Yeah. And what would these? What would be the distinguishing feature of these people? I, I never. You don't have to go into this. You don't want. But I don't. I genuinely don't understand <laughs> what the extra category is for. Well, can I answer your question about the Christian right losing <laughs> yeah, the culture yeah, war? Why you skip the question about so, the So, um, what I was going to say is this whole idea of religious freedom, when I said earlier that the idea about the government enforcing the rights or vindicating the rights of other, of, of minorities, whether they're racial minorities or sexual minorities, is necessarily the infringement of, re- of your religious freedom, right? So mm-hmm. like, that was the issue with the tax, the Christian school tax exempt status. Mm-hmm. And it's the issue now with LGBT rights, right? So like they viewed, um, uh, Obergefell, uh, same sex marriage, an infringement on religious freedom. Uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop, the, the case mm-hmm. involving the baker who wouldn't bake the cake for the gay wedding, because that is, in their view, an infringement of their religious freedom. And again, now they're taking this employment discrimination case in which religion was not an issue before the Supreme Court, right? They did not raise the religion issue in that case. But Gorsuch, in his opinion, in his major- majority opinion, says, well, we haven't answered the religion question today, but that would be a- an issue potentially in another case. And they're clinging to that Mm. as the possibility of like, oh, okay, so we can maybe get a religious out or religious exemption from having to um, comply with this another um, civil rights law. So um, they, I think, are over the past several years are embracing the idea that, yes, they may be in the minority on public opinion on these issues, but they're going to use that to say we're now in a minority opinion, but we shouldn't be oppressed over it, that we should have these carve outs. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's not what Mm. civil rights laws are for. Like there, if you either have a civil right or you don't have a civil right, right? Like it's not like if you carve it away for certain people who are, I mean, think about it. I mean, We wouldn't have, well, that's what they tried to do with the, you know, with the Christian schools, you know, that they had a religious exemption to discriminate against black students. But as a political matter, if they got 
some of those carve outs, that's an example of something that might lessen the intensity of the grievance. And then the other, the other one would be if they, if, if they got a favorable abortion ruling, right? Which. Yeah, but I don't, you know, so you think, like, you think that it's going to lessen the intensity of the grievance, but like, there's very little that lessens the intensity of the grievance, right? The grievance well, that's my is- question. Do you think, <laughs> what do you think? Do you think anything could or would? I mean, as I said, there are now so many issues invoked. Uh, you know, so many issues defining the tribal lines that I wonder. But um, and 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 as you uh, and and again, you think immigration is a big galvanizing issue for these people as well, and so on. But I'm asking you. No, I, I'm asking. Uh, I mean, it is my general feeling that the less threatened you make groups of people feel. Uh, the less intensely motivated they are to fight. Yeah, that is my feeling. But but uh, I'm just asking you the question. Right. But I think that their view is that they are under siege by a secular society in multiple ways. Right. So even if, and it'll take years, okay, it'll take years of litigation in the courts to to figure out, okay, so like under what circumstances... I mean, so church, I mean, churches are already exempt from Title VII. So if you're a church under Title VII, you can't be made to hire someone to, to work as a priest or, Mm -hmm. or other, um, position in your church who doesn't meet your, um, religious requirements. Um, so it's not like churches are going to be shut down over this, but I think that with what, um, many in the Christian right are thinking now is they want a hobby lobby for the Title VII law. So Hobby Mm -hmm. Lobby was the case where the craft store chain did not have to provide the contraception benefit in its insurance plan to its employees based on a religious objection. And so that's what they're aiming for here is just a private corporation who doesn't, whose owners say it violates their religious beliefs to hire a gay person. Um, and so this will be, you know, years of litigation over what this means, under what circumstances, and so forth. And mm-hmm. so that's why the, the judges are so important to them. And the more judges that Mitch McConnell can confirm uh, before the election mm-hmm. uh, is very crucial. And so there is, I mean, it seems, it might look to you like, oh, they've reached their limit here. <laughs> But there's always some other permutation and, you know, they, they feel like under Trump, they have, they're getting judges. They're, they have, uh, political appointees and agencies overturning Obama era regulations and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a, a long list of things that they want to be able to continue to do. So you see this as being a very highly energized uh, constituency for some time to come, regardless of how these these issues play out almost. Yeah. I mean, it may get smaller or be a smaller segment of the electorate, but they still remain very well organized and disciplined and also very well funded. Now, is it I was going to ask about whether it's getting smaller. uh, How is is the. Is the demographic shape of it changing, if at all, uh, like uh, especially at the younger age levels? Are they uh, succeeding and sustaining? Um, they're not. You're shaking your head. No, they're not. So, um, but, you know, that still doesn't tell us, you know, okay, so maybe people that you can't encourage an 18 year old to join your church, but when that 18 year old is 35, right. can you? Right. right. So, I mean, those are questions that we don't know the answers to yet. Um, but the, in the generation that's 18 to 25 or 29 right now, the segment of them that are evangelical is shrinking. And, and the segment of the population of white evangelicals is shrinking because the population is becoming less white and less religious. Mm-hmm. But evangelicalism is maintaining its ground in terms of the proportion of white, Christ- of, of American Christianity. So, um, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Fascinating book. Um, anything else you want to say about it before we go? 
Not that I can think of off the top of my head. We should at least <laughs> we covered repeat, a lot of ground. We should at least repeat the title. <laughs> Unholy yeah. is the title. Why white evangelicals worship at the altar of Donald Trump? And yes, there is a lot we didn't have time to get to. So uh, this is no substitute for reading the book. <laughs> That's right. As I'm sure you'll agree. Okay. Well, thank thanks so much, uh, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. Okay. Bye-bye.